Good evening and welcome to our second part of our uh, double header tonight with Zabriel Zucchini. Um, we haven't had a chance to actually say anything to Zabriel, so he'll come on really cold, but uh, <laughs> he can hear us, so I apologise for that. <laughs> so, Vic, I'm just going to go straight into it. I'll leave you to it. And okay. I'll you, uh, Gabriel. Hiya. Hello. Hi. Sorry, How are you doing? <laughs> straight into the defense. Yeah, you're live on Channel 4, do not swear, etc, etc. <laughs> Great pleasure to see you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this evening. Um, I know your time with the town was short, but, uh, you know, of course, to research this, I'm looking for you, your career, and it's a fantastic career. I mean, it really is a very interesting and fascinating time. We'll get to yeah. your time at Swindon later on, but I, I want to go yeah. right back to the beginning. Um and obviously, it's a question you get asked a lot. You play for the Democratic Republic of the Congo, is that right? Yeah. Internationally. Yeah. But you were yeah. born in Kinshasa in Zaire. So explain yeah. that. Then. No, it's basically, it's, it's still the same country, but they just, uh, the name changed. That's the main thing. You know? uh, <laughs> right. so, so a lot of people, I do ask, you get asked that question all the time, that question all the time. But the country ended up splitting into two um Congo's basically uh, there's Congo and there's the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo and I happen to be in the part of the Democratic Republic. Well, that explains that. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, <laughs> you're currently you're currently manager of Spalding United, the Tulips. Uh, yeah. and just explain the situation you're in at the minute because obviously non-league football below a certain level has, has been um, truncated. Where, where are you at at the minute? At the minute, the season was null and void, so uh, it was very difficult because I came in. Uh, did a lot of transfers and wanted the team to gel to sort of have a, have a good running. And then in the end, there was, um, yeah, the decision was to null and void. So it made it a lot more difficult. Um, and the way non-league works is completely different to obviously the football league. So and all the players get deregistered at the end of the season. You've got to start again. So it gives me a chance at least to start pre-season now with a date to look forward to and to hopefully hit the ground running come when the season starts. Uh, and and that will be the traditional start of the season, if you like, will it? Yeah, um, the dates we have is sort of early August. Um, so that will be around the, the time the uh, normal season would start. So it gives me a chance to get good good pre-season under um, the boys' belts and to hopefully have them ready come the first kick of the, the season. And hopefully people in watching you, which would be great, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think the, the way the dates have been set and hopefully um, the news we're getting about um, the cases lowering uh, sort of helps that cause more. But I do... I do hope we can, um, yeah, we can have people in and get some sort of buzz back and some sort of normality. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll ask you briefly about the European Super League because we'll get on to your career in a minute because it is fabulous. Yeah. But uh, the European Super League, here we are. You're, you've been a professional footballer. Mm -hmm. And I heard the point earlier that footballers will go where the money is. And I, mm. I, it's difficult to argue with that, isn't it? I mean, it, what's your view on it? It is difficult to argue with it, but you've got to blame the people at the top. You know, um, the people at the top is in in the way it's been done. I think it's it's they've lost a lot of integrity. Um, a lot of the the morals of the game as well have been lost because you know the fans do make the football clubs. Um, and the fact that they've sort of been making these deals behind the scenes and sort of breaking away from the true values of the game is the main problem. They of course they'll have supporters abroad because they're all big clubs and they have supporters all over the world. But it's you know it's it's the 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 fans in the country that have supported the club throughout and are the life and soul of the country of, of the club sorry but ultimately if you're a professional footballer if somebody offers you a whacking great contract you're going to go after it aren't you yeah i think in most cases but them, them guys they earn enough how much money do you want you know what is you know that's what I, feel. <laughs> I feel that they actually earn so much that they it wouldn't change their lives that much you know because they can actually get anything they want as we speak right now you know so it's, it's just a bit of a, a bit of greed i think as well on on the, the at the top of the game and for the players you can't blame them they're, they're associated with these clubs um so ultimately they will do what their employer tells them to do um a couple of questions already why are you still not playing that's from lee uh, uh, <laughs> what is your situation what as in playing I mean, yeah no, i well the the problem with me is the whole pandemic sort of fast forwarded my career you know um i i was i was gonna carry on playing um for another two seasons maybe maybe even a bit, bit more but i had so many opportunities during the pandemic and when the season curtailed early it there were so many opportunities that i may not get when i retire so for me i was coming to the end of my career but it was better to jump into the opportunities i'm getting now 
um, because they may not be there when I retire. So for me, it just made sense um, to not go through the motions. I mean, within the football league as well, I've, I've kind of done everything possible within the football league. You know, I've won, I've won the JPT. I've, I've been promoted five times. There's, yeah. there's no, there's no more. You know, the, the hunger is. Even though I'm hungry and I'd ob- obviously want to keep playing, but the hunger wouldn't be the same because I've sort of kind of done done it all really in the football league. You know. Well, you, you kind of preempted what I was going to say to you because there's one word that figures largely in your career, and that's promotion. My goodness <laughs> me. I, I, you know, I don't know many players who've got it more than you have. That's an extraordinary amount. Isn't it five promotions? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the fact that a lot of people say, yeah, you've got a lot of promotions. But um, the main thing is the fact that it's been done at every level. You know, I've been promoted from League Two to League One, to League One to the Championship and the Championship to the Premiership. So there's, there's honestly, I, even though, yeah, I could have carried on playing for the love of the game, but it was important for me to um, to to venture out and see other things and the fact I'm still in the game for me is the most important thing but for the playing side I sort of ticked every box that I really wanted to tick yeah they certainly have uh, and also you've had a post-lockdown haircut unlike some of us of course which, uh, <laughs> uh, so apologies for the for the bird's nest ask you about that. yeah it's, ask it's being you. done next week uh, so <laughs> thank goodness for that it's but it's like it was in the 70s man it's gone really kind of you know. uh, right so you started your career with Orion and uh, yeah. a former Swindon legend of course Martin Ling was involved with the O's uh, how, how was he in terms of your career getting underway no, he was instrumental uh, in, in my career. I mean, he was he was just getting into management at the time. He just kind of at the end of his career at Leighton Orient. And then he um, he was partly my manager as well at under 15s in the youth team. So he's the one that sort of pushed for me to get my first pro contract. So I do owe a lot to him. I mean, he, he came to a training a training session and he, he said I wasn't great technically, but but he, he, he saw someone that slides on concrete. So there's something we can work with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. Yes, uh, hopefully the the Brisbane Road pitch was a little better than that, was it? <laughs> no, it, it was it was a facility that we was using, um, which yeah, right now in this day and age in twenty twenty one, I'm not sure it will be deemed legal. Saying, but... <laughs> <laughs> Extraordinary. So uh, you know, tackling a, a bustling centre forward wasn't a problem after that, was it? <laughs> oh no, no, no. I mean, so he saw that and. Yeah, he sort of fine-tuned me and started working with me extra sessions. And, uh, yeah, like I said, I owe a lot to him for when I did get the move. You know, he was he was very involved in in that progression. So how did it go with Leighton Orient? Um, well, it went pretty well, I think, didn't it? Uh, 2003 to 2006, mm. uh, there's that word again, uh, promotion, 2005, 2006. <laughs> and also the, the Orient team looked not Fulham at the FA Cup, which led... To a move, just describe your your time at Orient then in terms of how successful it was. Pretty successful, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was very successful. I mean, I, I broke in very early at 16, um, playing nearly week in, week out at 17 on to before I got the move. So for me personally, it was a development stage, but I was becoming a big part of the squad. You know, I wasn't a bit part player. I was actually a mainstay in the squad and just, uh, just growing, growing every game. So I've, I've, I've got so much experience um, from that. And that's what helped me well kick on sort of thing because it was um I was getting games so early in my career and by the time I'd left I'd already played nearly a hundred games. So it was a big part of it. And you always get the feeling with Orient, it's a kind of nice special family club because it's in the shadows of West Ham, of course, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um and you know, poor old Orient fans, they've they've taken their fair share of stick with non league, etc. <laughs> over the years, haven't they? They do <laughs> stick with them though, don't they? Yeah, they do. You know, it's always it's to be fair around sort of East London, even around London. I'd say I'd say it's always always everyone's second team. You know, so they 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 get a lot of the West Ham lot that don't go West Ham come to Orient, and then you get you get that family feel around the place. So they've had it hard. I take my hat off to them for always sticking by the club, uh, no matter what's happened. And uh, yeah, now at least they're back in the football league and hopefully get to kick on soon. So promotion, that was your first taste of it. Um, mm. As a footballer, if you've got that on your CV, it's a great thing to have. And what's that feeling like of, of clinching a move up the leagues? I mean, it's it's incredible because it's uh, it's the season so long with the especially in the in the lower leagues, you know, with the Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday. So to have something to show for that at the end, and then you can get to enjoy your summer and look forward to stepping up the league. It's it's there's nothing like it really. I mean, it's when I got my first one, 
I got told to sort of savor it because it's one of them things that do happen sometimes once in a lifetime. If you get one, you've done very well, you know. So I looked at it and thought, you know what, let me savor this in case, you know, it doesn't happen again, which which it kept happening. But <laughs> at, the time, <laughs> at, the, at the time, it was honestly like it was um, it was something that I tried to savor for a long time and to enjoy myself and to just feel proud of what we'd achieved that day that year. Yeah, you got a bit greedy, to be fair, didn't you? Um, so, uh, lots of questions coming in. Um, any interest in player man- And I'll drop these in as we go along, but we'll yeah, course, carry on yeah. with your quick. Um, any interest in a player manager of soon-to-be League Two team? Good fan base. <laughs> I know you've seen the town recently, but I'll ask you about that in a minute. But, you know, wider speaking, obviously you'd like to manage in the Football League, I'm guessing, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, I mean, um, I, I, that's all. Obviously, your ambition is to manage as high as you can. Um, it's something I've fallen into, and I'm enjoying it, the early part of it. And obviously, with progression, and the timing will be right one day when um, I do feel that I'm ready, for, sort of, for a role. And for me, you know, I'm read, always ready for a challenge. So if the phone rang, <laughs> I would be up there <laughs> at any time. So, but, I'm, I, but I feel that I've not had the experience yet to to really build my name um so we're, we're going off just my my name and the passion i show for the game but i think the managerial skills and the intricate stuff i still need to sort of master and actually you're doing what a lot of players don't do you're you're starting i'm not going to say you know low down because that's yeah. unfair to spalding but mm. in the lower reaches of the pyramid as it were yeah i mean it's a it's a it's a big risk i mean but for me i think the, the difference with this level and a lot of the the higher level teams is that I'm literally learning everything, um, and I'm I'm le- I'm basically the director of football, the chief scout, <laughs> the manager. I'm literally recruiting, recruit, so head of recruitment is me. So I I literally have control of everything. I control everything that goes on at the club. There's nothing that goes on um, that I don't know about. Literally from top to bottom, and the board have been very good to me. I mean, they they really trusted me with everything. And give me full control. So there's so if I end up ever getting sacked or leaving, I know it was through myself and I was true to myself throughout, you know, where the difference is where other people at different clubs may have people in their ear telling them what to do sometimes, or maybe having a bit more control, more say. But for me, they've left me to it and let me recruit my own staff and let me get on with it the way I want to get on with it. So I've only got myself to judge on it. You wouldn't fancy being at Tottenham at the minute, would you, to be fair? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but even the great Brian Clough, of course, he used to paint, you know, do the painting at Arley Ball. So, you know, he started right at the very bottom, as it were, in terms of, you know, be- where it led to. So, mm. you know, why not? Uh, right. So, Fulham, uh, you knocked them out of the FA Cup, um, you know, and th- they're at a decent level. And then you get a move to Craven Cottage for the princely sum of a million pounds. Now... Mm. When somebody says the transfer is a million pounds, do you actually take any notice of that, or do you just negotiate your deal and get on with the football? What happens? No, it was it was actually quite a, a funny process because um, they they came in uh, really early after the after the game. Well, after we knocked them out of the um, the FA Cup game, they wanted to sign me then, you know. Um, so they approached, which our owner at the time was Barry Hearn, uh, who's you know obviously a very very smart guy, and they came with two hundred fifty thousand. And Barry Hearn didn't at the time. He didn't actually think I was worth the two hundred fifty thousand, but he said they seemed keen. So let's squeeze them for what they got you know, at the time. And so they doubled that, and then they, they, then it became a few more. A few more clubs started sort of. There was like a bidding war with three or four clubs, um, and in the end, they they stretched all the way to a million with add-ons. So they they made Orient ended up making a lot of money from them in the end. So it was it actually ended up. So I don't know. The lights gone. The lights yeah. gone out. The lights gone out in Spalding. What's going on? <laughs> You're not no, paid the electric no. bill. No, <laughs> it'll be back in a minute. It counts my movement. So if if I've been still for a long time, it just turns right. off. <laughs> okay. Well, if yeah. you move around, that's fine. It's not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it ended up ended to. I think it ended up being one point five in the end um, because of every time I moved, or it still managed to profit somehow. I don't know how Barry Hearn pulled that off. So. Yeah, they made they made a lot of money in there. It wasn't. I mean, you didn't play a lot for them, did you, Fulham? So, how difficult was that to deal with? Because as a footballer, what you want to do is play, isn't it? I mean, it's as simple as that, really. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a strange one for me because how I looked at it is I've come from League Two, you know, and I've jumped straight to the Premiership, 
So it was a big learning curve and I was one for the future where they saw it. I got a four year deal. Uh, so they looked at it as in developing me for a couple of years and then hopefully kick on. But I think me being me, I like playing football. I need to be playing, you know. So I started, I started, I wanted to to get out and to to experience, maybe go on loan, maybe a little bit higher than I played before to sort of just get the experience a little bit higher and keep going. But at Fulham, Chris Coleman really, he really liked me to be fair. He was the manager and he had me on the bench nearly every game up till when I went out on loan. But he had me on the bench every single game and I was learning as I was watching. I was learning so much and he stuck me in for a couple of League Cup games. So in the end, it was just more of a big learning curve training with um, top players and then, um, yeah, just getting what you can from what you can learn from these players that have done so well in their career. So you get a loan move to Stoke, which kind of works out, really, because you, you, you sign for them in one season, don't you? And then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. go back the following season and the P word comes back again, doesn't it? So, <laughs> you know, um, you know, so could you play on a windy night at Stoke on a Tuesday? This is what... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand that saying because I did feel for the clubs that that did come to Stoke because it is the noisiest place I think I've ever ever played um i mean it was from the minute the minute i stepped into the place i just the crowd were just always on top of and the way tony pulis had the team set out it was just constant it was constant it was they were putting teams under pressure and i just i fitted into that mold i mean with fulham when i went out to get a bit more technical get better on the ball but pulis wanted me for me you know what i've been doing my whole my whole career just been heading and tackling and just the basic stuff and that's what he wanted and I fitted straight into his plan. Is it, uh, is it unfair, his reputation? His reputation is long ball. Uh, mm. But, you know, I know he's not had great success in recent times, but, you know, he did a great job for Stoke, didn't he? He has. I mean, he, for me, I just thought, with limited resources and what he produces, as in terms of um, of getting teams out of trouble and, and getting teams promoted, he's, he's one of the best. I mean, he, he's a great man-manager. And he just seems to get the team moving in the same direction that he has in his head. Yeah, he's 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 hard to work for. I mean, it's, oh, it's gone off again. <laughs> I mean, he's hard to work for. I, I need to change the system. You <laughs> do. It's really hard to work. It's really hard. He's really hard to work for. As in his training is very demanding. Um, but he does get the results. Um, as soon as you know, as soon as soon as you go on a pitch, everyone knows exactly. Uh, what they need to do, and everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet. It just, it just happens like that with him. Why, why do you think then that people, because ultimately the Stoke fans, or it appeared uh, the Stoke mm. chairman wanted mm. a change, and what, why is it like at West Brom? Uh, mm. You know, why is it you think the fans don't take to him eventually? What, what, what is that? Do you think? I, I think he comes in. He just is what he is. You know, he comes in and he's to get results, and he does whatever he needs to do to get results with the players he's got. And um, that's just what he does. And he doesn't budge to if fans want entertainment or they want this sort of football, he doesn't budge from his philosophy. And that's probably why. But sometimes I think a lot of clubs like Stoke, for example, I, I would go as far as saying that they may have regretted, you know, when he left because uh, they went down in the end. Yeah, they did. And, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. They, and they've struggled to come back anywhere near where, where he had them, you know. So... Sometimes you you gotta be careful what you wish for. So you sometimes gotta pick between the football or 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 the success, you know. So um, yeah. So it's it's quite it's quite difficult. It's quite a difficult. One. And he seems to be a person that he's just stuck in his ways, and he wants to to implement his style on whatever sort of team he's got. And no matter what anyone says, he's quite a very stubborn manager. I wonder what Arsenal fans think of uh, Arsene Wenger now, because they've not exactly uh, <laughs> pulled any trees up, have they? Um, <laughs> this from Stephen. How would uh, Zach describe his uh, playing style? I, I mean, we've already had a hint of what you said, but mm. you know, how, are you a straightforward head it, kick it? Are you better than that? I mean, uh, you know, in your brief time at Swindon, you, you you're a footballer, aren't you? I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, my my playing style, as in what my playing style or my playing style when I'm managing, it's two different. Well, things. no, you, well, both if you wish. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my as a play, player, yeah, as as a player, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm your all out old school centre back, really. You know, um, I, I was I was quick. I mean, I, I can tackle and 
I'd, I'd, I'd get in the way of most things. You know, that's that's the way I sort of um, looked at it. I'd, I'd do anything to keep a, a clean sheet. And that was my main focus was defending, you know, and that was it. Um, and But the game, the game has sort of evolved. Uh, is evolved where teams want to play possession and it's a little bit more expansive. And I played for teams like Peterborough, you know, Peterborough are known for playing good football, playing great football. And and during my time there, I sort of learned how to play in that sort of system. And at Swindon as well, I feel every time I was called upon, I did what I needed to do, you know. So it was, um, it it was, a, I can mix it, you know, I can, I can mix it. But if, if I had to pick a way, if I had to describe myself, I'd know that I would say I'm a no nonsense and you can always count on me. <laughs> You can't turn your light on, though, can you, really? That's a bit of a problem. <laughs> I don't even need to change the system. Really <laughs> and you open your blinds or something. We don't mind if you do that for a minute. Um, no. Oh, he's gone completely oh, now. Oh, he's back again. Uh, so, uh, it's, <laughs> are you in your office or you're at home? Where, where are you? I'm in my office. <laughs> ah, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, saving the club some money with that system. It's not good, is it? <laughs> Uh, right. OK, what about your team then? How would you like them to play? And my team, I, I would personally want them to play good football. I mean, I, I would still have the defender that that does um, do the, the nasty stuff, as you say. But personally, I'd want them to play good football. and But progressive football. I don't like to play sideways too much. I like to, to keep attacking and progressing and cutting through the lines. And that's, that's sort of the football I want to play. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, this is from Dave. Bit tongue-in-cheek, mm. I suggest. But it's uh, he, Dave says, if I, Vic, was manager yeah. of Swindon Town, would you be his assistant? That's about as likely as a helicopter <laughs> flying on Mars. Oh, hang on a minute. A helicopter has flown on Mars. <laughs> but I, I don't know. On a serious side of that, would you yeah. fancy being an assistant first and then a manager with that suit? Yeah, no, personally, like... I it's only when um, when I got asked the question. I mean, like, as in, obviously, I thought it was a joke on on social media, so I sort of entertained it a little bit and thought, yeah, why not? You know, but for me, I, I'd like to just get in the game. If I had the opportunity, I'd take it with both hands and um, just do the best I can. And for me, I, I don't think I'd let anyone down with the with the effort. I may not have the the credentials at the moment because I've only just stuck, just got into it. But if if I had a chance to learn alongside someone who who knows the game. There's no reason why I couldn't do it. That rules me out then. Right, let's talk about promotion with Stoke. <laughs> uh, because, you know, promotion to the Premier League and uh, mm. fantastic. So uh, tell us about that experience. You've experienced promotion once mm. uh, in the lower leagues. Promotion to the Premier League. How's that seem? Mm. That was just, yeah, incredible, you know, especially at the time where I, I was just at Fulham. And it was a it was good for me to show that I can actually play at a level which is not too far from what Fulham was because when I when I stepped into Stoke, um, I actually felt at the time they potentially a bigger club, you know. So it was a, it was one of those things where I thought, yeah, the massive club, and just to 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 play a big part in them getting promoted again was just a bit surreal, you know. Uh, going to the Premier League and just looking at um, how it made the town feel, the town came alive. You just we had a tour bus going around the town and you just saw what it meant to everyone. And I think just for ourselves as well, our families, it just, it was a very, very proud moment. Yeah, extra, uh, I, I mean, it is a footballing place, isn't it, Stoke, to be honest. And those of us who went to the old Victoria ground once or twice, an incredible place, you know, yeah. uh, a great atmosphere. And it was a real shame when you drove past the site of the old Victoria ground, which was empty and waste ground for a long time, yeah. wasn't it? To yeah. imagine that in that waste ground, Stanley Matthews once played mm. football yeah. is quite extraordinary. Uh, so yeah. from Stoke to Peterborough then, and um, guess what? Another promotion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, so from Stoke, when I, when I, um, I went from Stoke, it was, uh, it, was, it was a footballing decision again, you know. Yeah, Peterborough showed a lot of interest. And Stoke made it pretty clear that they've had the, the Premier League money now. So they, they're looking at different targets. And fair enough, you know, football is a business at the end of the day. And I, I was just grateful that they were honest and said that I probably wouldn't get as much game time as well, you know. So it made sense. Darren Ferguson gave me a call. And yeah, I went down there and I became, you know, one of their main players. Where, where I'd gone from clubs that have a lot of experience internationals and I'm sort of not making the numbers, but I'm just a young kid learning. You know, uh, and now I've gone to Peterborough with sort of a big name, you know, where I've, I've started to to make a bit of noise 
So I've gone to Peterborough literally to to get them promoted, to help get them promoted. Yeah, uh, which you did. And this mm. was a time, of course, when Posh were championship uh, mm. material. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've always kind of thought Peterborough were a similar sort of club to Swindon, really. And, yeah. and you know, I think that's fair to say. Mm. And, and for a club like either of them to be in the championship... It's not quite as different, uh, the same as it was when you're in the old Division Two, is it? The, the money is a lot bigger in the Championship now than it oh, was years yeah. ago. Oh yeah, well, the step up when you when you get that step up, it's it's massive. You know, you realise as well every week you're playing a team who have some sort of Premier League history as well. You know, so it's it's just always difficult. Um, it's really good for the fans. I mean, they get to experience it. And at times they don't enjoy it because the step up is is very difficult. So you, they may not get the results they want. But for the experience in itself, if um, yeah, to the, the jump is massive. So in terms of of playing there, you you, you had a decent um, time at Peterborough, and again mm. another League One playoff final against Huddersfield three nil. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that I assume was at Wembley. So how was that? No, that was um, at Old Trafford. So oh, it was Old Trafford. That, yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it was that year when it was at Old Trafford, and for us again, you have got to realise the the manager at Peterborough is. Alex Ferguson's son so yeah. it was yeah, it yeah. made it a little bit more special and it was a one-off game and we just made we it was quite a close game so the score doesn't actually reveal what it was it was three late goals you know we scored in the last 15 minutes and um got three late goals and it was just the icing on the cake again just just been used to playing under so much pressure that we just knew I don't know why I knew from the semi-final that we'd go all the way again yeah so it was again a great feeling of promotion and that that then then I knew that the playoff, the playoff final seemed a better way of getting promoted, but you just can't guarantee that you'll win the no. final. <laughs> you know, if you could guarantee yeah, well, yeah. the feeling, it would actually be the playoff final because just because of all the drama leading up to it. What about the experience, though? It does shorten the pre uh, your summer break, doesn't it? Mm. And mm. it does seem to have a lot of an effect on teams, yeah. you know, because they're behind in, they don't know what sort of player to buy for the following mm. season, uh, which league they'll be in, all that kind of mm -hmm. thing. So how difficult is that to deal with? Or don't you care the moment you get promotion? Hey, party time. Yeah, yeah, a bit of that. But at the same time, I do think sometimes it can play slightly an advantage as well because the momentum you sort of take into um, into the next season. So you may look at it as in you've been winning games, you won a semi-final, you won a final and you keep that going. Um, if you've got a shorter time. But yeah, it gives t um, the, the staff less time to prepare, obviously, and not knowing what league you'll be in, it's a totally different kettle of fish, what players you get in, you know, the two different levels. So, again, but I do think everyone would have done their homework, especially someone like Darren, because he looks at things very, very detailed. So he probably did look at targets from the Championship and targets from League One, just in case he covered both bases, I'm pretty sure. But, yeah, it does leave a little bit less. And as the Championship is slightly more demanding, I would actually say that pre-season is, is a lot harder because a lot of teams have had more rest. Yeah, um, his association with Peterborough is incredible, isn't it? I mean, he's been backwards and forwards like nobody's business, but he just seemed <laughs> to have this this affinity with the club. Yeah, he seems to be the the right person for the place. I think sometimes your face just fits the place, and uh, Darren just seems to be the person that is sort of made for Taylor, made for Peterborough. The way the philosophy works, the way the club works, the way they conduct themselves. He likes to work with young players and build build them up like a stepping stone into their next career as well. He does that very well. He's good at tracking players from non-league. And that's the sort of philosophy Peter have. They sell players on and they keep that as their business model and it, it works to perfection. How difficult is it for somebody like him? Because he does, you know, we all, as you mentioned, who his father is, and we all know that. I mean, it must be difficult yeah. because to a certain extent, you're in your father's shadow, aren't you? And you, you kind of can't quite get out of that shadow somehow. Yeah, it's difficult. I mean, especially him being probably the most famous manager in this country we've ever had you know so it just becomes even more difficult uh for him but he takes it well in his stride and he's quite he's quite you know he's quite laid back about all of it you know he takes it on the chin sometimes we go um we go to away games and fans will be saying certain comments but he takes it well and he just gets on with it and he's he's managed to build himself a, a good reputation at this level um getting promotions uh, left right and center and hopefully getting another one soon yeah, um, yeah. Of course, they recently did rather well against the town, which we'll discuss later. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, how, have you spoken to any former managers um, of yours for advice on your role as Spalding manager? I guess you must have done. And yeah. anybody aspiring in the game of management would want to learn from the people they've already played under. Yeah, I mean, I spoke to the first person I spoke to was Darren because he let me watch Peterborough a few training sessions uh, just to see how he sort of goes about his day-to-day -day business. So I was just shadowing kind of thing, just having a look and taking notes on how he does things. Then another player I spoke about was uh, I spoke to was actually at Swindon. It was Matt Taylor who was at Swindon because he's mm -hmm. coaching at Tottenham. So he invited me down as well. So I had a look at some of his sessions. So it's just like I've been tapping into whoever I can tap into. Tony Poulis, I've been on the phone to him uh, when I got the job just as well, just to get some knowledge and what was important, what was the first things I sort of had to bear in mind. Um, he just said to me about recruitment. So he helped me out with that, telling me about how to go about my business. So, yeah, that's three people. And that's I, I plan to speak to a lot more, you know, but at the moment, they've sort of been, been the ones I sort of leaned on. Uh, what what would you say at half time is your <laughs> style? Are you an arm around the shoulder person, or are you a throw the teacups across the room sort of bloke? What, you know, you know, because you're learning this, and uh, yeah. you've got to learn yourself how to react, yeah. haven't you? Uh, I, yeah. I'm guessing you're pretty laid back. So I mean, I've been tested. <laughs> 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 so, so you can you you are avert you're not averse to the art of teacup throwing then i mean like look so i've been since i've been always about um in my early 20s i've always been most clubs i've moved to i've, I've been captain you know or, or vice captain so I, you don't get that role by being too laid back you know so, so i have got it in me to turn that switch if i have to um so, and th yeah, there's been like little tests. I mean, I I'm a laid back person and I'm a positive person usually, but I do know as from being a player so recently, I do know how some players can perceive that you can be too nice, you know? So I do know how to, how to sort of balance that out. So I, I am strict. Um, and, but again, I let all my staff sort of be my go between uh, so where I won't engage too much or get too friendly with my players. So if they had sort of any inquiries, any, any issues, they can go through my staff and my staff will let me know uh, just to sort of build that barrier where we're not too, too close or too, too, too attached. Uh, and do you, I, I, another thing is if you've been a professional and played at a, you know, very pretty high level, mm. um, you know, you, you've got to realize of course that the players you're managing aren't of that ability. So yeah, yeah. how difficult is that to sort of <laughs> deal with really? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, you've got to be very patient at this level. I'll be honest with you. You know, there's some drills that you may stop more times than you you wish you stop. You, uh, you hope to stop it. You know, um, and that's that's the problem. But sometimes you've just got to look at it. The aim for you being there is to to help them develop and hopefully hit that sort of level one day. You know, so you have to be patient, um, and that's just the key to be patient and not to expect them to be of the level sort of you've been at and the players you've played against or played with. Uh, Ian, this is from Ian. Cracking interview. Ooh. Loving Gab's enthusiasm. Uh, what a refreshing change. Love to hear his thoughts on the club now after watching them compared to when uh, Richie Wellens and his team were here. Well, we'll get to Ooh. your views on Swindon and, and what you thought of them in a moment. But enthusiasm is coming across and your love of football <laughs> is coming across. I think, yeah. you know, to me, that is the biggest thing coming out of this. You you love the game, don't you? Yeah, no, I absolutely love the game, you know, and, and this, just being out of it as well, I can enjoy it like you guys have been enjoying it, you know, from an outside perspective. And it's just, it's nice that I can actually have them conversations now where before it would be someone talking about maybe a club I'm playing for where I'm so involved and so emotionally involved where I might see it as criticism or and take it to heart where now I can kind of look at it from the outside point of view and actually enjoy everything I'm doing. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, let's uh, talk about then your move to the Greek, Greek Super League. I'm guessing it's not quite the European Super League. Uh, this is Col <laughs> <laughs> Coloni. Uh, your your, your yeah. stay there wasn't too long. Uh, tell us yeah. about your experience of the Greek Super League. Yeah, I mean, it came at a point where at Peterborough, I felt like I've been there a long time. Um, and then I just started feeling a bit stale, if you know what I mean. I just feel, felt like I needed a change. Um, and then I got I got a random call uh, to play in the Greek Super League and 
they wanted me so quickly and saying the first game is Olympiacos away. In my head, oh. I'm thinking, wow, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Biggie. So, so, yeah. yeah, exactly. So I've gone from, you know, from turning up to training at Peterborough and then being told that this is on the table and it was only a short-term contract. There was no problem for me to go out there, see see what it was like. Um, I sort of knew about the Greek sort of financial problems that they have with their finances. So I wanted it to be short. They wanted it to be a two and a half year contract, but I kind of wanted to make sure. And I had a young family as well. So it wasn't something I wanted to sort of commit to, but I wanted that on my CV now to see what it's like to, to, to play abroad. And yeah, I, I did enjoy it. Yeah, well, not not a bad place to go. I'm guessing sunshine, lovely, very nice. Uh, and uh, but as you say, at the time, I think Greece was going through some pretty torrid financial mm. Mm. problems, weren't they? I think we all remember those. Um, so yeah, tough times. So you come back and you play for Northampton and Gillingham. Whilst at Northampton, um, mm. as, you played Man United, I think, didn't you? And and I read this yeah. famous interview where you said, "Well, we didn't have any problem with Wayne Rooney. We kept him pretty quiet." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in between there, you know, when when I was in Greece, in between there, I actually went back to Peterborough for right. two years. So I went back to Peterborough for two years um, and then got the move to Northampton. Uh, and then when I went to Northampton, yeah, we did draw um, Man U in the, in the League Cup, uh, which was a great experience again to test yourself against them sort of players. And yeah, to be fair, yeah, Rooney had a very quiet game. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I did make a cheeky comment um, uh, when it when I was interviewed to see how because I did quite physically I, I dominated him on the day um, and it was be mentioned by everyone you know so it was just an interview and I think they picked something to sort of make a make a headline but he, he he didn't have the best day and but they did win the game they got the job done but but it just seemed to stand out the way that our battle was quite interesting. Yeah, I was going to say, um, they did actually win 3-1, I think. Wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, right, let, let's get to Swindon then. Because, uh, have you, how many times have you played against Swindon then? Have you, uh, oh, how many? Yeah, plenty I was going to say, you must have done. Yeah, plenty yeah. of Peterborough. I mean, I played a lot under the time, well, to be fair, I played everyone. I played against Charlie Austin. I played in them, that period. I played... Um, is it Simon Cox? Yeah, Simon Cox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, down at his period. So there's quite a lot of time. Even when Mark Cooper was there, when he was playing like literally dangerous football, where it was just so risky, <laughs> I was I, I was playing in that era as well. So I, I played, I'll say, more than a handful of times, a lot of times. Did you play in that bonkers five four game at London Road? Did you play yeah, in that one? Yeah, I played in that. <laughs> it, it, it was incredible, wasn't it? I just uh, it was like what what's going on now? What's happening? <laughs> and you got the win in the last minute, I think, didn't yeah. you? <laughs> Incredible. Uh, yeah. Now, let's get to Swindon. Then, and this is uh, from Ben. Um, I remember your debut at Bradford away, which is where you were. Because yeah. uh, I was there. I remember it well. Done all right, to be honest, said mm -hmm. Ben. Uh, and I, I remember the green boots. You had green boots that day, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. For, for someone that's so non-nonsense, I'm quite passionate. <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty, pretty neat green boots, i got to say, because yeah. they stood out. Because I always remember those green boots for some bizarre reason. <laughs> so, so how did that come about then? Because Dion, Dion Conroy, I think, had... Yeah. Um, picked up a serious injury and of course yeah. he subsequently had another one um mm. and so i think richie wellens wanted some cover so is that mm. how the move came about yeah i mean i was at gillingham um and i i managed to get out of gillingham when steve evans went um he sort of kind of it it didn't i didn't feel like i fit into what he was trying to do because i was injured at the time he took over and um yeah i asked him to because i want to play football of course i was fit again and i wanted to play football and for me, I, I decided to cancel my own contract and to just look for somewhere else. I'd rather that than be going in there where I'm the captain of the football club and a new manager's come in and he's sort of making it clear that I'm not um, part of his plans without, you know, telling me really, you know. So I went in there, I've confronted him and said, look, I want to I wanna leave. And uh, yeah, we got the papers done and I was out of there. And within a few days, I mean, I, I wanted to spend a bit of time away and to enjoy myself a little bit because I was a bit down from not playing for a few weeks, you know. And um yeah, I had a message on Twitter actually from No Hunt. <laughs> That's how it actually, actually came about from Twitter, you know, which which just tells you how the world's moved on. Um then he, he messaged Was me this straight on your on your feed or a direct message? No, what no, no, it? direct direct message because we, oh, we right. follow, yeah we <laughs> I was gonna I could I could just imagine, you know, uh <laughs> 
you know, to Lionel Messi, would you like to join Manchester City? <laughs> <laughs> Sign Pep yeah, Guardiola, so, you know, it'd be weird. Yeah. <laughs> so he sent me a message um, saying, now, oh, do you fancy, um, we just seen you're available, do you fancy coming down um, to Swindon? So first thing I did was check the maps and see how far it was. <laughs> So from my place in Surrey because I live in Surrey, and I thought, oh, it's a long way to go if it's a trial. I'll, I'll try to find out if it's a trial or did he want to sign it. So I said to him, um, like I said to Noel, I said because I played against him plenty. So I said, look, you know what I'm about. Um, so if you do want want me in, you know exactly what you're getting. You know, um, I, I'm not at the age where I want to go and have a trial for anyone. You know, it's um, mm. you, I've been around long enough for you to know what I'll bring to the table. You know. And he said, no, 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 it's not a trial, but it's just to make sure because I had an injury just prior to, with Gillingham to make sure that all the medical was fine. And so I thought, OK, no problem. So I went down there um, and yeah, straight away, the lads made me feel welcome. There was a few players that I'd, knew, I, I'd known already from from just through football and uh, the buzz around the place, the team spirit was just something I'd never seen. I mean, from the first day, I just went straight in and everyone was so close. It was just it was great. I mean, I and I jumped straight in. I, I think I played. I trained on the Thursday. By Friday, I was travelling to Bradford and uh, played on the Saturday. And that that's exactly how it came about. It, it happened so fast, but I've already felt part of like a a family. Last year's team was unbelievable. Yeah, of course. Owen Doyle wasn't allowed to play in that game because he was on loan mm. from Bradford, of course. Mm. Uh, yeah. And it was a two-one defeat, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but by all you know, by all um, sort of reports, and I know because I was there, you mm. had a pretty decent game. So mm. you must have been pretty satisfied with that debut. Yeah, no, I was because um, I think I didn't get even a chance to to integrate with the team that much. You know, I, I didn't realise the football as well was so expansive um, at the time because I thought this this is League Two. I didn't expect the team to be passing that way the way the team was. So it was it was it was like a pleasant surprise where. I actually didn't know um, the level was actually really, really good because I thought, okay, I've dropped down a league uh, from Gillingham, so I should find this quite easy, or I'll be get, um, yeah, I'd get a bit, a bit irritated by some of the decisions. But just the way Richie had the team playing at the time was incredible, and I fitted straight in just into his philosophy and the way the the players as well, the way they got on, the team spirit, everything just fitted into everything I like about football. Yeah, it was high press, wasn't it? And uh, here's a question from Anthony White. What was the Christmas party like in Glasgow when you were at Swindon? <laughs> yeah, from what I can remember. It's really... <laughs> <laughs> was that after the away game at Grimsby, if I remember rightly? Uh, yeah, when was it? I think, it, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was. Um, yeah, we uh, we really enjoyed ourselves, you know. We, we were doing well, so it was... Um, it was, I think, at a period as well where where we we needed it. I feel like we needed it. The team was bonding, and it was just great to to get out there and and enjoy ourselves and sort of let our hair down. And the main thing was to just make sure no one does anything too stupid, you know, and to come, to come back in one piece. Because <laughs> that's the problem these days, isn't it? We've all got <laughs> these things, um, yeah. <laughs> and you know, if if say you're out on the town, wherever mm. you might be. Mm -hmm. People can take pictures of you, can't they? Yeah, that's what it is. And then um, we went there to be fair, like the, the lads, I, I had no sort of worry um, with any of the lads. But uh, the thing is, it's a very young team. Uh, so some people do get a bit carried away. But with with the team we had and the, the leaders, uh, sort of like myself, the older sort of pros, will make sure that nothing ever gets out of hand or anything happens. So we did look after the, the younger lads, just to make sure we had a good time and no one overstepped the mark. Would you have wanted to stay at Swindon longer? Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I think I would have liked to have seen it seen it through, um, really. But I think there was a period where I was I was playing games and then I wasn't playing, and then I sort of came back into it out of nowhere um, against Cambridge. If you remember the Boxing Day game where we won four nil. Yeah. yeah, so I came back into there and I thought I deserved you know a longer run basically um, into the team, but. You know, I think in my contract ended and I sort of served my purpose as to what I needed to do. And I, I left on good terms. So do you accept that, you know, as a footballer? Because, you know, you want to know where your future is, don't you? It's, it's tough, yeah. isn't it? And you are... Yeah, you have to. I mean, I mean, for me, I can look at it and think, wow, that's really harsh, you know? Like, because I thought I'd come in, I'd done exceptionally well in under the circumstances where I hadn't 
been playing and they told me to come in and look after the dressing room and do what I've been doing for years. And for me, I've done it as an actual. I felt that I was an actual at it. The, the, the players felt like they, they took a shine to me. Um, I posted a video there of Jerry Yates singing my name, you know? Yeah, I saw <laughs> that the other day. Yes, yes, yes. So that, the, so that from a player who's just come into the building, that tells you how close um, I was with all the players, you know? So the fact that I didn't get a chance to see it through would probably be one of my, my regrets just because I wanted to be there with the boys to the end. Um, and I'm not one of the players that like to jump ship in between, you know? Um, so, so it was a target of mine. But when I was told it wouldn't be extended, Again, no problem. I came in, I enjoyed myself. And for someone who was only there for four, three, four months, I felt like I'd been there the whole season. Yeah, you wouldn't have qualified for a medal then. Is that right? Or do you count yeah, that no. as a promotion? Oh, no. They, they, well, they counted it as a promotion. I think they, they appealed to... Um, no, but I mean you personally. Do you count that oh, as one of your... Well, they, because they count it, I'll add it to mine. You know? <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Why not? Absolutely. Uh, this is from Anthony. I always thought you did well for us. Shame you couldn't sign for longer. So there you are. Mm. That, that backs up what you were saying there. Um, right. 29 international appearances. Yeah. You said about, I mean, we should say over 500 career appearances, which mm. is fabulous. Mm. One appearance for Dagenham and Redbridge. Yeah. Which... You know, okay, that we'll count that. Um, we'll count. I think we won. We won that game. So no, fair that. enough. <laughs> <laughs> One successful appearance for Dagenham. Yeah. Uh, Twenty-nine international appearances for uh, the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. So, mm. tell us about the step up to international football. Then, yeah, the step up, funny enough, was really early. Uh, it was probably when I wasn't quite ready. Um, I was stepped in at 19 while I was still at Leighton Orient. And this is actually another strange one because the manager at um, for the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, was manager of Cambridge at one stage, um, Cambridge United. Uh, so he saw me in a game where Leighton Orient played against Cambridge and he um, he managed to, to call me up to come in with the senior team and to just integrate me. I, th I think the key was they wanted to, to make sure that I played for Congo and in case I was going to end up playing for England, you know, so they tied me down from early. <laughs> so I think that's the logic behind it at the time because I was rising very quickly. Um, but for me, I always said if, if if my country calls me up, I'd always represent my country, you know, and that's always been my, my, my feeling around it. So, yeah, it came up really early and then I'd spent a lot of time away from it where I felt I started building my career and then I just came straight in and I ended up captain in the country for the last three years of... Um, of my international career, which again is probably the pinnacle of my career to to lead my sure. country out and yeah. and to get yeah. to the African Cup of Nations semi final. So it it's I, I can't complain at all the achievements. To be honest with you, I've got a bronze medal in the third and fourth place um, game, and for me, I think that sort of tops off my international career. Of course, and to captain your country is the pinnacle for any player, I would imagine. Yeah. So yeah. fabulous. Uh, were you invited? Listen, Pete, were you invited back for the? trophy presentation which was a bizarre thing on friday i seem to remember uh, no, no I, I think i was still waiting for that post <laughs> <laughs> okay fair enough uh right um now i'll ask you about swindon in a moment but i have to mm. ask you this question because it's on mm. wikipedia mm. so it must be true right Ooh, yeah. Now, apparently, there's a modern pop singer called Dizzy Rascal. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently, you appeared in a video of his. Is this yeah. right? How yeah, did that I happen? Mean, I mean, he's, he's from uh, Bow, which is near Leighton Orient. So it's right near Leighton. Uh, and at the time when we're, so we're roughly the same age, I think he's a year older than me. And at the time, I was making a little buzz. At, uh, at they managed to get us together um, to sort of, we sort of started doing little appearances together and then. We just became friends and since then we became friends we started hanging around and then i think i was at stoke at the time and he called me and said look i need someone to come uh, to a video shoot to do some kick-ups i said have you seen me play like you know, that's not something i can do. i'd need 50 takes for that so man, i got down there and yeah i did I, I managed to manage get the take he wanted um and then yeah drove back and that was it and then all i know is a, it's a hit song so i managed to get my face everywhere and uh credit to him really do you get a percentage of the royalties <laughs> i mean i mean he, he cut me out of the royalties but he just paid for the day i think he gave you expenses for the day and that was it <laughs> well five promotions international appearances a jpt and 
<laughs> in a Dizzy Rascal video. Goodness me. Yeah. Is there no end to this? <laughs> Extraordinary. And I should also say, of course, uh, you're very much involved in my old business, which is radio, and you've been mm. football summarising for BBC Radio Cambridgeshire, mm. which is how you came about to, to come back to the county ground recently, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed it. I've, I've, I've gone with, uh, with the BBC and they've sort of thrown me around with BBC Cambridgeshire, I've done BBC Sport, on BBC Africa, so anywhere they can sort of fit me in and they think I fit the role, they sort of put me in, so which has been great. It's been one of the things I've enjoyed while being retired. It was something I was offered just before I made the uh, decision to retire, which which helps me out. And I managed to get back to the county ground, obviously, recently, for a game with um, with Peter Bro, <laughs> which didn't go too well for him. <laughs> no. I, and I remember your comment afterwards, what's happened to the ticky-tacky football? So... <laughs> Yeah, the, what it was is because because I hadn't, I, all I all I see is is what I see on social media. So I don't I don't actually know the direction that the club was going under. So I sort of wanted to put the feelers out there before I see it for myself, you know. So I I just said um I asked is it still you know ticky tacky or is it as it changed? And obviously the the res, the huge response I was getting is that it was the complete opposite to that. Yeah, what did you think? I mean, obviously the club is going through. You know, turbulent times on and off the pitch. They've just recently yeah. lost a manager, of course. John Sherrill's mm. gone. Um, what is I your the interview what, was quite strange? The when he what the one where he disappeared? Yeah, I yes, thought, I thought that was pretty strange, though. It, it's like he didn't <laughs> want to actually say what is going on. Um, and uh, so I heard it the other day, and I just couldn't work out what what is going on. You know, and if if he said, um, for example, he he felt like this a few weeks ago, he should have went then, really. No? We, um, we know he's had a few personal problems with the loss of his mm, parents and things. So he's had mm -hmm. some tough times. Mm -hmm. uh, but what did you think of the team's performance? Bearing in mind what you yeah. said about the team last year. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we as fans love last season. It mm. was immense. You know, mm. it was fabulous. Having seen every single game home and away, I think, last season, it was mm. tremendous. What What were your views on this time round? To, to be fair, look, I, I watched um, some clips of their previous games before I commentated on them, just to do my own research uh, and for my notes and what I was going to say on the day and what I was going to talk about. So I saw that it wasn't the same. Obviously, it wasn't as expansive. It was a bit more get into the front man and sort of work around um, Pittman as it was what I can see mainly. But yeah, it was the total opposite. But then you look at the team, the team is literally torn apart the the team from last season as well you know um so there's a new way obviously of playing and he's got to play the way he knows really because the way richie had the team set up is is quite hard to do in league two you know it's not many teams that play that expansive and that sort of free free flowing football um at that level so i can see why the why sort of the fans were 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 not happy because obviously what they've gone from to to what it is now isn't it's chalk and cheese, really, uh, the way the football um, is played, especially. But against Peterborough, believe it or not, I didn't think they were too bad, if I'm honest, um, at the start. But just the mistakes, I mean, the, the goals are just... It's the defending at the time, the goals. It's It was so easily avoidable. And I, I, to be honest, when it when Peterborough got one, they could have gone and got as many as they wanted. There was The keeper, to be fair, Lee Camp made a few really good saves. Mm. But yeah, I feel I just felt it was too easy to play against. That's what. I'm yeah, they had a lot of pace, didn't they, Peterborough? Which yeah. ultimately was mm. the difference, wasn't it? Mm. Really. Yeah. So, in terms of of doing that radio work, you're watching games, mm. and I'm guessing, you know, that's helped you in terms of how you see teams set up, all that kind mm. of thing, Rick. Really. Yeah, I think because as well where the positioning as well of where the radio people sit, um, it 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 does give you the whole the whole picture, and you've got to be very you've got to be focused on what you're doing. You've got to explain th things. So you do get to see the way teams are setting up, the changes in the lineup, and how it's affecting the other team. You kind of get to see. So I'm sort of learning my managerial stuff as well while I'm doing the commentary at the same time. So but at the same time, I wanted to um, to be involved in the media as well. And the manager thing happened to come along and sort of took my interest away from that a little bit. But at the same time, I do enjoy the radio work itself. Just I get to see games and get to still be involved in it. How, how strange are you finding it? Because I've done several games this season and you, you know, you have to go through the temperature check and you have to wear the mask. <laughs> and it, it is a bizarre and strange experience, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, there's so many protocols and 
so many things you've got to remember um, before actually getting into the stadium because you've got to stop every two seconds for this check, for that check, to have you done track and trace. Have you, there's there's a lot going on. Um, I mean, it's it just seems to be the way the way we're going now, you know, and it probably will be with us for a long time. But I feel like, yeah, it's changed the way the game um, sort of was just a simple Saturday, just turn up to the stadium and get on with it. Uh, but now it's so much protocols and things you've got to do. So I guess we're probably going to have to get used to it and uh, just make sure you turn up early because it will take a while yeah. to get in. <laughs> yeah, I, I, they had 4,000 at Wembley yesterday, didn't they? And they all, I think, yeah. had to go through tests and things like that. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I'm old enough to have been um, stabbed with a needle, so I'm hoping I've got a second one coming up. So I hope that is some way to my advantage. Uh, but <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, there's got to be some advantage to being old. Uh, this is from Neil. Uh, would you sign back for Swindon next season if you had the chance? Well, obviously, you've, you've finished playing. But if a call came in from a football club, have you done now? If you think, well, I've done it now and I don't want this, to do it again? This, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I probably... Funny enough, uh, this is not even me joking. I probably get more offers to play now than when I was available. <laughs> that, that's actually really that annoying. must be annoying. <laughs> it's, it's actually unbelievable. I mean, even when I when I first went to Sporting and sort of the directors were saying, "Do you fancy just you know a game?" Or I, I don't I, like I, for me when I'm done with something and I want to focus on something, I give it one hundred percent. You know, um, as I feel, I've just fulfilled. I've fulfilled everything I need to fulfill. You'd rather. A young player who's hungry and wants to achieve certain things, then someone that's sort of just there for the sake of it. You know, for me, when I when I was done with playing football, I was done. You know, uh, I felt like I'd left everything on the pitch, gave everything, and for me now it's about my next step in, whether it's radio, whether it's media or or, or coaching, whatever I get my hands on, I need to give it one hundred percent and put playing to one side because. I just feel I'm at the stage where I, I don't actually have anything to prove to myself or to anyone, you know. I, I feel like I've enjoyed my journey. I've done everything I can do and anything I do now is just, I felt it before. It's not going to have the same adrenaline. Well, I think that's a really honest appraisal. And, you know, you often hear footballers say, oh, I wish I'd carried on playing a bit more. But <laughs> if you feel, I mean, yeah. the thing is you can still play in the odd game of something or other, can't you? I mean, it, goodness me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, even when I've had a kick around with, with yeah. fellow pros, I've, I mean, it's just, I've, I've looked at it and thought, yeah, it's, it weren't down to the ability. And my, my, my whole fear was always that when you have, you're forced into retirement, you know? So, you know, when you're forced into it because everyone can see your legs have gone or I, I, I ended on a high, you know, where people yeah. are still questioning, questioning and saying, oh, why have you retired? They're asking themselves the question. So I'd rather end on a high than to the point where, I've been forced to retire by genuinely just being over the hill, you know? Yeah, I always think of Muhammad Ali and think there was a time, mm. mate. There was a time and you've gone past that time. Um, this is mm -hmm. a couple of Antonys have, have commented. What a thoroughly nice guy Gabriel is. I wish him all the success in the manager's oh, chair. Uh, <laughs> another Anthony, well-spoken, intelligent guy. Uh, I think that's you, not me. Uh, so... <laughs> 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 and this from Pete, brilliant interview and a lovely chap. He's welcome back to the county ground anytime. And I think, you know, for somebody who only spent, you know, three yeah. months with the club, that's yeah. pretty good. I think you should yeah, take that I mean, on board. I mean, like I said, it, as soon as I stepped in, everyone did make me feel welcome. And it's always been a club sort of traditionally, it's always been a good club, you know, Swindon. And as, when I did go there, I did, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. I lived locally with, with uh, DJ. And um, so me, me and uh, Drew of a DJ, yeah? <laughs> who went to um, Charlton. Yes. So we, we really uh, enjoyed ourselves. We made ourselves at home there and we was in a flat and cooking for each other. So it, we really enjoyed each other. So we had uh, Isgrove come round every now and then. So it was it was a good, good period. So it felt like a little family and I just really enjoyed it. And even when I went back, I, I, knew, I knew a lot of the staff. I enjoyed it. Lovely. It's, I've just got to ask you one final question. You said you live in Surrey. You manage Spalding. Mm. Now, my geography... <laughs> Hang on a minute. Yeah. Surrey, Spalding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it is a long way, but the chairman um, is a pretty wealthy guy, you know? <laughs> he does, Private he does jet, pretty... then, is it? <laughs> That's next season, after promotion. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he, he looks after me quite well. He puts... Um, he puts me up in the hotel day before training, day before games. 
and uh, lets me get on with it as, as, as well as I can. And to be fair, because a lot of my work I have to do in Radio Cambridge here, which is Peterborough based, um, so I'm up there a lot anyway. So it's, it's, um, it makes sense because all my, my sort of work is sort of in one area. So, yeah, I managed to get about and make it work. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. It's been great. And, uh, and, I, and as I say, somebody who spent a really the blink of an eye at Swindon, you know, yeah. what a fabulous career you've had and you oh, know, what, you. what wonderful <laughs> story. So uh, I, there you. we are, Chris. I mean, I did, you yeah. know, researching Gabriel, Gabriel's career, you just go through it and you think, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> thank you very much thank you just the five promotions was it is that all (laughs) at the moment at the moment moment. (laughs) yeah Yeah, and i tell you what there are a lot of swindon fans you'll suddenly start uh, uh, following spalding town next season so there you go there you go You'll, you'll see the twitter followers (laughs) <laughs> bumper so <laughs> well, thank you thank you very much <laughs> thank you very much thank you. okay gabrielle don't go away i'm going to stop okay. this stream but don't go away because we need you afterwards so thank you very much for everybody watching um as we had two streams tonight so thank you for bearing with us on both of them we will be back to normal next monday with our monday night panel um peter uh, portsmouth tomorrow night uh so let's just see what it is after that so thank you very much for watching and we'll see you soon